Hello everyone, and welcome to another Lens Studio tutorial. This is a really exciting video that I'm making because it is the first one that we'll be doing with Lens Studio 2.0. And with this latest update, they have added a lot of features and functionality, and I'm just going to get right into it. So, when we look at the new software, it really doesn't look much different at all. Um, the first thing that I'm going to point you to is the preview panel and on the bottom here we see this little tab that says without simulation so what you'll see here is we have accurate device simulation for our lens preview now so let's say we want to build a lens for snap camera we can check the desktop and see you know the vertical or I'm sorry the horizontal and I personally have an iPhone X so I know that the resolution is much longer and, and more narrow so I would test it on this and this is really good to make sure that your lens works across all devices and then next what you'll see if we go up here to the top left right next to project info we now see a live update of our lens size so this is good when we're adding stuff to our scene to know in real time how big the project is getting and it'll kind of help us narrow down what assets we have that we need to uh, maybe compress more and then also they give you a nice link here to help you optimize the performance on your assets and then if we click project info we have this handy lens preview thing right here so before you would have to add a preview when you're submitting your lens but now you can still do it that way but they've added this really handy feature so if we click add lens preview what it's going to do is it's going to generate a preview from your lens with all of these different models and um, triggers so like smile or uh, some of the markers and I guess let's let's just add something really quick to show you what I mean um, we'll just add a sphere in here and then if we go back to that preview so now it'll render with that preview and we can just easily generate a quick preview if you don't want to you know record one ourselves um, and then once it's in here and we hit apply and then we publish the lens it'll automatically populate there so it'll just save us an extra step okay so the first thing I want to get into is the post effects now I know what you're thinking you're probably thinking it's it's more of the color filters that they've added but what they've actually done is they've renamed post effects to actual effects and what was once known as post effects is now color correction so these are all of the old post effects with actually some updated uh, textures that we have seen before so if we go into the post effects now we see some great new effects the first one I'm gonna pick is VHS this is a great example so what I want to point out about this is that all of these post effects are using the materials and it added the VHS material here so let's go into that and let's check out what these settings are so we have a uh, chromatic aberration settings so we can adjust the coloring on that we have the saturation maybe we turn that way up so they're giving us these really complex customizable effects that we can do and you can change so many things about this and you can also change stuff about this programmatically so let's add a new one and I'll show you what I mean so let's add the shake effect this is a really fun one if you want to like make it seem like there's an earthquake or something and if we click on this shake effect we can affect the horizontal and the vertical shake on here if we maybe make it larger that way then it's gonna shake much more to the side and then conversely if I do it like this it's gonna go much more up and down and then you can also do the frequency of it so if I just go like down to like one and one it's gonna be a really slow almost like you're on like a one of those grocery store like horsey machines um, but one that I wanted to talk about now is how we can programmatically change these so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create a script here and I'm gonna add just an empty scene object and add that script to the scene so that we can start affecting the scene and I'm gonna create an input statement for the material I'm just gonna call it Matt let's bring that in here the shake one so now we can start affecting the properties of the shake and the way we can do that is actually instead of having to even go into the API online if you didn't want to do that what you could do is hover over that property and it'll tell you right there 
what the name of it is. So we have UniAmple X and well actually what I'll be looking at is the frequency because okay so uni frequency and this is what I need to be changing and it's going to be passing in as a vector 2 because you see it has two different numbers in it. So let's go into the script and let's just test this out. Right now they're both at 1 so we're going to type script.mat to reference that and then dot main pass with the P capitalized. This will allow us to access those properties. And then dot uni freak. Uh, what was it again? Yeah, okay. So that was right. And then equals new vec2. And let's do six and eight. Let's see what that does. Okay, so that changed it. So then let's also try changing the amplitude of each of these. So script.map.mainpass.uniampleX. And let's change that to like 5. Oops. We'll do the same thing for the Y. Let's see how that changes it. Okay, yeah, that makes it much crazier. Okay, so the point is, is that you can change all of the properties in these post effects programmatically just by hovering over them and seeing what the property means. And then what we can do is like, let's, let's have that change when we tap something. So let's grab a tap event from the API. Let's find that in the website copy their example. Let's put that right here. We'll just copy all of this code and we'll change the value. So let's go back to one here. We'll make this one as well. So now once we tap, it'll slow way down. So you can change this however you want in your scene. So I won't go into all of the post effects, but those are some of my favorites that I've noticed so far. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the new image system and this is going to be replacing what was once called the sprites and the sprites are still available in here if we scroll all the way to the bottom they're under this legacy section so we can still use the legacy sprite billboard and face sprite but I would suggest using the new image system and instead of billboard using screen image and instead of face sprite using face image it's going to be the exact same as using the sprite was and I can tell you there's really nothing different about it uh, if we click screen image here the only real difference that you'll have to worry about unless you're getting into advanced stuff is the full frame region and this is basically gonna make your lives easier because now with the click of a button you can select what the range of your content is so a lot of the times when you're making a lens you don't want the snapchat UI to get in the way of your stuff and that would be why you would use the safe render because then that would change this region here so that the only place that your image can go is within those bounds if we want to have something full screen like a background we would just do full frame and then once we get into this screen image here, you'll see we have something now called the screen transform. And they really beefed up the functionality in here. Um, if this is kind of overwhelming, that's okay. I was overwhelmed when I saw this at first as well, but it's really giving you a lot more options to uh, adjust where the image is kind of pinned, where its position is fixed or its offsets. But if you want to go back to the original transform, just click advanced and then basic transform down at the bottom here. So if you're, you know, if you're not comfortable learning this new stuff or kind of playing around with it, just go back to the basic transform until you're comfortable and everything will be okay. <laughs> so the image, like I said, is going to be pretty much the exact same as the sprite. The only real difference you'll notice is the vertical and horizontal alignment. So they've just added this to give us a lot more control over which part of the screen the image is attached to. So if I put the vertical alignment at the bottom, it's going to stick down there at the bottom and then at the top. Um, it's not going to really change much on the horizontal because it's already at the edges of the screen. 
but this is going to be really handy to adjust your image position quickly. So if we want to reference this image in the script, we can do the same way. Let's just uh, look it up in the API. We'll just scroll up here in the classes until we find image here. It's going to all be pretty much the same as the sprite visuals. So all we need to really change is how we're naming it. We go input component. Instead of typing sprite visual, it's just going to be image. And you'll see we can reference it just like we did before. So this is going to be the same for the screen image as well as the face image. If we wanted to just add a new face image in here, we could use that as well. It's, our, it's just attached to a head binding. Another thing I'm going to get into is the scene config right here that you'll see. And if you don't see this, what you could do is go to window and click default layout and that will bring in this extra panel here. Also what you can do is go to camera and click scene config right there and it'll bring it up. So what we have here is two cameras with a mesh in each of them and they're also attached to their own layers. Each of those cameras are taking in a render target that I've created. All of those render targets are taking the device camera texture, but the render targets are being added to the capture and live targets. So what you'll see in the preview is that we have only the sphere, but in the 3D scene, there's a sphere and a cube. So this sphere is what the user will see while they're recording the snap, and that is the live target. Once they're done recording the snap, the video that will play back to them will show what's in the capture target right here, box two. So let's say I'm recording a snap of this right now. While I'm recording it, I'll be seeing this sphere in front of me, and then once I'm done recording and the video starts playing back to me, the sphere would disappear and everything in the box camera would be shown, everything that is being rendered on that target. So this is great if you want to add some custom UI that you don't want to be shown in the video after the person is done recording. It's also cool because you can kind of trick some people too, maybe make them think they look really pretty while they're recording, but then once the video is done and it's playing back to them, they look like they have a massive pimple on their head or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of possibility with this. If you don't want to have to mess with that, just don't even touch it and you'll be fine. So let's just get rid of that. Another great thing that they have added, this is something that I'm really excited to talk about as a pet lover. They have added object tracking and specifically they've added pet tracking. So we can now track images to our furry friends. Let's just try one right now. You'll see this cute little cat here. It's as simple as just like adding a face sprite. You'll just change the image that you want. I don't really have anything, but you get the picture. If we want to preview it, we have a cat preview right here. It's not really cute, but I'm sure you'll have a better idea than I did. You can look at the object tracking here and see that the tracking type is cat and dogs tracking, but we can change that. We could just, just do cats or just dogs. Um, they also have hand tracking. This is a really fun one. They also have body tracking. So this is going to be cool because what we can do with the body tracking is attach it to the center, the left or the right shoulder. The classic scenario with this is like the angel and the devil over somebody's shoulders, you know, and like telling them to do right or wrong. Lots of different possibilities with that. Another huge thing that I haven't even gotten a chance to try out myself is location tracking. Now, they've added these buildings, basically these big landmark buildings like Buckingham Palace, and they've created a 3D tracker. So you can put whatever you want on Buckingham Palace, and it will, it has the occlusion here, so you can kind of put stuff behind it, and 
this is just this is really high tech this is amazing because all you have to do is aim your camera at the landmark once it detects it whatever you want will show up in there okay so like the screen image replacing the sprite visuals now we have a new text object which is just pretty much the exact same as the text labels except now it's called text and if it's on the orthographic camera it's going to be screen text so if we want to reference that programmatically all we have to do is do input component dot text and then name it and it'll have pretty much all the same properties as before like I said you just will just look it up in the API and Let's see. And it looks like it has the exact same properties as the original label did. So not much change there. Uh, just basically, I think, beefing up the text abilities and maybe fixing some bugs. But what I want to talk about in the text is a really handy feature they added, which is dynamic text. So now we can reference individual users' phone device data, basically, meaning if we want to get their username, or we want to get the date when they recorded the snap, or their city, or like the birth date. So like maybe you wanted to make a countdown lens for your birthday coming up. So with all of these, they will change based on who is using them. Uh, right now, for me, it is April 8th. So if I were to add this in here, it would say April 8th, 2019. Probably should delete that text before it. Let's try something else. Display name, it's just gonna say snap user on the preview, but that's where their username will show up. In addition to that, they also have the same functionality with the images where you can change the alignment of the text. So if we want to align it on the bottom or the top or the left or the right, we can do that at the click of a button. Another thing they added is the vertical and the horizontal overflow options. So right now we have overflow selected and basically what that is going to do is it's going to just adjust the position, move it up every time you have a new line added. If we select truncate, basically that's shortening off the end of it. Um, that's the best way I can explain it. It really isn't going to affect you too much, um, I think. You won't have to worry about it that much. The one you would maybe want to worry about is horizontal overflow. Now wrap is the most useful one because that will keep your text in the bounds of the screen. If we click truncate, it's just going to turn into one long line that is never moving once it goes past the screen. If we change that to overflow, it's going to be constantly moving because it's going to be fixed at that center position. So like I said, you're going to want to keep it at wrap most of the time. I can think of very few reasons why you wouldn't. Alright everyone, well that pretty much sums up most of the major features that they have added in the new Lens Studio update. Um, I'm sure that I missed a couple things and if you have any questions or want to share one of your Lens Studio 2.0 creations, go ahead and comment below and I would love to check it out. Thanks for watching everyone.